Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Jimmy Dore Show. We have a special guest with us. Uh, he's an academic, a lawyer, a politician. You know him. He's a big progressive friend of the show. It's Ro Khan is here with us. Hi, Ro. How are you? Jimmy, thanks for having me back on. All right. Thank thanks for uh, taking time out of serving the people from the 17th Congressional District to talk with us today. First of all, Ro, you're a real deal progressive. That's why we like you at the show. And I just wanted to say congratulations or thank you for doing this. It's, this is a headline from The Nation. It says Congress finally pushed back against the imperial presidency with a vote to cut U.S. support for the war in Yemen. So you finally instituted the War Powers Act. It actually passed the Senate. What happened? Tell me what happened after that. Well, first time it's passed, Bernie Sanders and I got it through the House and Senate since 1973. We've never had a war powers resolution passed. It's it called for stopping or refueling of the Saudi planes bombing Yemen, uh, largest possible famine in, in, in the world. 14 million people affected. President vetoes it, uh, but he voluntarily suspended the refueling because of the political pressure. So uh, it did lead to the ceasefire in Hodeidah. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, problem. I mean, so the Saudis are still bombing. Uh, and so we have an I have an amendment uh, in the House in the National Defense Authorization uh, to stop any uh, spare parts or maintenance to the Saudis. Uh, we've already stopped the refueling uh, that uh, we're negotiating and fighting to keep it in the, the Senate final bill. And so. So Trump ran on an, an anti-interventionist platform and he said we should get the hell out of there and we should make them pay uh, trillions of dollars for our military to help them. And he's not doing any of that. In fact, he just sent uh, sending our soldiers to Saudi Arabia to guard their oil. So he's kind of uh, don't you think he's going to lose support from that from his base? I, I, I do. And look, I haven't been partisan about it when Trump uh... Uh, called for withdrawing uh, troops uh, out of Afghanistan. I wrote a Washington Post op-ed. The op-ed, they titled it, Trump is right, let's withdraw. And when Trump is trying to make peace in North Korea, I criticized Bolton. I said Democrats should support Trump. Uh, and I wrote a whole long memo to the White House saying, look, uh, Trump, you, Mr. President, you ran on this. Uh, why are we supporting Saudi bombing of Yemen? You should be the first president that signs the War Powers Resolution. But he didn't. He vetoed it. And he's... Uh, increasing the support of the Saudis. And it's in direct contradiction to, to how he ran. And that, see, Ro, that's exactly the kind of thing I think the Democrats should be doing to actually oppose Trump, uh, because now you have him on record of going against his campaign rhetoric. Now you've boxed him in, and now you have something you could actually run against him on. It's That's exactly what, and just like what Bernie called for when uh, the Democrats won the House back, was that we should now be aggressive and pass Medicare for all and make Trump veto it or make the Republicans exactly. come, come out against it. So that's what I'm applauding that. Well, I appreciate that. And I, and I think we've got to be intellectually consistent. You know, one of the things that I found so odd is when John Bolton was fired, he had all these quote unquote pundits saying, oh, this is going to create instability and what are we going to do? John Bolton is one of the most disastrous people for foreign policy. It's the one thing that Trump did right was to fire him. And so, you know, we have to have an intellectual consistency. It just can't be reflexively opposed Trump. It's got to be, here's what you campaigned on, military restraint. When you do that, we'll say fine. But when you've broken those promises, we're going to point it out and we're going to actually deliver on the restraint that you campaigned on. Uh, I, of course, I agree with that 100 percent. I would just urge you to urge Bernie and everyone else to, uh, you know, as when it comes to foreign policy, you've been so great on it. Uh, the only thing I would urge you to uh, try to get the campaign to stop repeating CIA talking points when it comes to Venezuela, when it comes to Russia Gate, uh, Russia, you know, so that would be that those are self defeating. When Bernie does that, it only comes back to hurt him. So you can oppose intervention in Venezuela without first yeah. validating the CIA's pretext for invasion. So that's always a mistake. It doesn't get him any votes. So that's I'm just urging you as a co-chair to do that because I'm for a progressive becoming president and I want to help Bernie Sanders get, become president if that's possible. So I appreciate it. And, uh, and he is one of the very few who at least took on Dick Durbin and opposed the uh, intervention. And I know that there was people who had took, took exception to the language, but, uh, you know, and I've led a letter of the House to oppose the sanctions in, uh, in Venezuela that are hurting uh, poor people. I mean, and frankly, strengthening Madero. I mean, uh, the, 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 he's going and he's saying, look, uh, the, the, the Americans are putting sanctions and it's actually helping strengthen him. So some of these things are 
totally counterproductive. And one thing I do want to point out about Bernie Sanders is he's the only candidate in the field who has voted against Trump's military uh, defense increases. And that is really important. I mean, Trump's military budget is a hundred billion dollars more than Obama left it. A hundred billion dollars more. And for, you know, people say, how are you going to pay for free public college? Free public college is 80 billion. You know, high speed internet all over America, 40 billion. And I don't understand how you, you, you can't say I'm opposed to wars and then vote for Trump's budget. Or if you're voting for Trump's budget, have something reason for it. So, for example, if uh, uh, the, this national defense authorization, if they actually stop the war in Yemen or stop the war in Iran, fine, that's a tough vote. But when we didn't have the House and we didn't have the Senate, these were just Trump Republican budgets. And Sanders was the only one who had the guts to stand up for them. And I, I do think he needs to uh, point that out on the campaign trail. Yeah, uh, he certainly re- needs to help make a distinction between him and the other progressives who are running in the Democratic primary. And that'd be a great way. That'd be a great way. You know, Elizabeth Warren has a big vulnerability when it comes to her foreign policy. So that would be uh, that would be smart. That, that, you're one of the smart advisors that Bernie Sanders has. So I applaud that he needs more people like you. But let's get into. So now let's move on to something that is very confusing to dumb people yeah. like me. And so what, uh, you know, uh, since uh, my affiliation with Tulsi and I've become aware of her because of her, I've become aware of uh, politics in India. Uh, yeah. So it used- let me ask you, yeah, Tulsi may have voted against those defense budgets, too. So I I was just thinking of the leading candidates, uh, uh, but she's been uh, uh, strong on that. So I didn't uh, you know, she may uh, have voted against them as well. OK. So here's what the headlines used to be when Obama was president. Modi Obama bromance starts new chapter as U.S. president pens ode to an Indian uh, Indian prime minister. So that was when he wrote an uh, op-ed about pra- praising Modi. And then here, another one, CNN, his bromance turning point, U.S. relations. And now here, this was from 2015, you yourself, this is a tweet where you said you issued a video welcoming PM Modi and you attended a luncheon and all that and none of the protests. And I he- did. I appreciate a video. I think that was a mistake, but I did. Uh, I did attend a, uh, a, a event, uh, a lunch, uh, but I didn't, oh, I mean, or the SAP center, but I was never on stage with him uh, and I never issued a video, but that was that, that tweet. I think the campaign put out, I mean, there is no video. You can check okay. that. Okay. I did look, I didn't find it. So, uh, Kamala Harris also two years later welcomed Modi when he came to the United States. Uh, in fact, here's last week. Here's Steny Hoyer, the number two Democrat in the House, welcoming Modi. So my question, people like me get confused, right? So I'm like, well, wait a minute. I thought people are coming at Tulsi hard because of her association with Modi. I thought Modi was toxic. And then I look and there's bipartisan support for Modi, even yourself back in 2015, welcoming. And then Kamala Harris, nobody ever brings up you welcoming him or Kamala Harris or Obama's bromance. So what changed from 2017 when Kamala Harris was welcoming him to now? What changed? Well, first of all, he is the sitting prime minister and there has to be a relationship with the United States and India. Uh, and I, I, I think that's pragmatic. And no, no one was is going to criticize uh, a, a member of Congress or a senator or a president uh, from meeting him. I mean, that uh, would be a dereliction of duty to not meet with uh, the sitting prime minister of India. All I have said, and it's particularly tomorrow. Tomorrow is Gandhi's 150th birthday, and as you remember, Jimmy, my grandfather spent four years in jail in the 1940s during Gandhi's independence movement. All I have said is in America, we need to be clear that uh, uh, Hinduism, I'm of Hindu faith, is what Gandhi envisioned it to be, which is pluralism, that we should be uh, for uh, Muslim, Christian, Jews, Buddhists, uh, all having uh, the right to uh, practice their religion, that we shouldn't be for uh, nationalism, uh, and that we need to have a pluralistic interpretation of uh, of Hinduism. And, uh, and that's... Uh, all that I've I've said. So so you're saying that you can be for pluralist. So Modi would be considered a nationalist, right? He's not. He does. He his his pluralism isn't his thing. But you're saying as a diplomat, uh, you have to have relationships with someone who's the head of a country the size of India. So you can maybe oppose his internal politics, but you still have to keep a relationship with him uh, because you're going to do diplomacy, correct? 
Absolutely. And U.S. and India are strategic allies. I mean, there are a lot of places we need to uh, work together on uh, uh, issues of terrorism, on issues of uh, climate change, on issues of uh, uh, technology research. So, uh, and, uh, you know, actually Obama gave uh, Modi, when Modi came here, uh, Swami Vivekananda's uh, lecture of 1893 of Hinduism in uh, in Chicago. And Vivekananda talk, talked about uh, pluralism and how Hinduism at its core respects all faiths and uh, how sectarianism has led to bigotry. So I think as long as people are speaking out uh, for pluralism, uh, that's that's fine. And and I, you know, that's that's my only point. And I certainly didn't mean to uh, criticize any particular politician. OK, so that's all right. So one more. So there's one more part to this that I have to clear yeah. up. So you so that's the thing. When you became co-chair of Bernie Sanders campaign, your big thing was that you're not going to mudsling against other Democrats. No, I haven't. Right. Other than the only person I've called out by name is Pete Buttigieg. <laughs> I have. And that's Pete okay. said that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren were lying about uh, a Medicare for all and uh, that Medicare for all was going to take away choice. And I said, Pete, how can you have that position and then believe that we should have Medicare for seniors. Why aren't you for privatizing Medicare for seniors? Do you believe that seniors don't have choice? Because every senior gets automatically enrolled. So, uh, you know, there are things he has said that are just intellectually dishonest, and I've called him out. Now, I know that some people thought, did I, did I criticize Tulsi Gabbard? I have not criticized Tulsi Gabbard. I, I, I ask you to point to one tweet. I had replied to an article that Peter Friedrich wrote uh, pointing out that, uh, in which he had named Tulsi and me, pointing out uh, that there are uh, Hindu Americans with uh, uh, ties to certain groups uh, funding certain campaigns. And all I said is any Hindu American politician should make sure that we clearly uh, reject any form of nationalism and we embrace pluralism. And to the extent that Tulsi Gabbard does that, I, that's great. But I have never in any statement uh, criticized her. In fact, I have said that her voice on issues of getting us out of bad wars is important. And I have tweeted out that the DNC shouldn't be deciding uh, who to have on the debate stage, that Jimmy Carter uh, it was at 1% at this point, And the first debate in, seven, in, in 1976 wasn't until February of 1976. And who made uh, the DNC decide uh, to win out the field? Well, that's a uh... I, of course, I agree with the, the, all that stuff you just said. But so let me just so the people just so they have a clearer picture of, of what we're talking about yeah. right now in that tweet. So I want to show the people. So Tulsi had tweeted out why she decided to run for president. It's a video. And underneath this guy, Peter Friedrich, he this article he wrote. And here's what it says. It says long form narrative documenting how the U.S. affiliates of the RSS, a, a fascist paramilitary in India, Financed the rise of Tulsi Gabbard in exchange for her help rehabilitating Moni's tarnished, repu tarnished reputation. And so then you, underneath that, you boosted that post. You said, important article. It's the duty of every American politician. So that article was smearing Tulsi. So that's the problem people have with that, Roe, is that you said important article. And it wasn't. So then you went on to say we need uh, uh, pluralism, which is uh, Tulsi agrees with that, which, you know, her statement on this is a pluralist secular government is the only way to ensure that all individuals have their freedom to follow their religion or non-religious path of our choice. So that's definite. And she fights. And her st statement is she fights bigotry with aloha now this your tweet caused a lot of problems in the indian community so this is from indian americans uh publication indian american community divided over rokana's tweet on hindutva uh, while Hindu Americans urged the California congressman to withdraw the tweet, progressives and anti Hindutva activists laud his tweet. So that guy Friedrich is just a, you know, he's not a real writer. <laughs> you know that he has sketchy background. He's an activist involved with the terrorist organization himself. And that stuff he did was a smear towards her. And so you boosted that post and it's an important article. And so that's the problem people have with that. Now, do you regret that or what would happen? Here's what I would say, Jimmy. I mean, look, they're, they're, in politics, uh, I respect any uh, person's voice and journalist's voice. I mean, people say, don't go on Jimmy Dore's show. And uh, he's, he's uh, uh, going to smear people. But, but come on, you know, I mean, I know, being in Congress, running for president, these are important 
privileges. And you should be uh, never criticize, in my view, uh, uh, critics. Peter Friedrich, in that article, had mentioned me too. In fact, he said that uh, one of the people uh, who gave Tulsi money uh, had given me money. That's why it came on our uh, article. And I uh, wanted to say to him that, look, it's an important article that you're pointing out that there may be uh, some right wing groups in the United States. And we ought to be clear uh, that we reject that kind of politics here. Uh, I didn't think uh, at the time in any way that that was me attacking uh, Tulsi Gabbard. And I do think that uh, Peter Friedrich, to the point he's making, that uh, uh, Hindu American politicians should re reject right wing nationalism. I, I think that's fair. But, uh, you know, to the extent if Tulsi has done that, that's great. Uh, but I, I have never, you know, there's no, there, there's no gain to Senator Sanders uh, by uh, criticizing Tulsi Gabbard. Well, there might be. I mean, uh, if it in, endears the can Sanders campaign to the progressive uh, wing of the California Democratic Party, right? I mean, uh, there's a lot of people who have made made that insinuation, correct? Well, I mean, you, you know, you, you need a 15 percent viability, right, in Iowa. And my sense is that hopefully a lot of Tulsi supporters, if uh, Tulsi doesn't get there, would, would support Senator Sanders. So. Uh, I, I don't think that there are places, look, are there places I disagree with Tulsi? Sure. I mean, are there places that disagrees with me? Sure. But I have never uh, it, it singled her out or criticized her in the way I have Pete Buttigieg. And she's been very gracious. She was actually in Iowa just a week ago after this whole brouhaha. And she praised some of the work I was doing there on tech jobs. And so uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I wish her well. I think she should be part of the debates. Uh, Obviously, I hope Senator Sanders is the nominee. Well, OK, so now uh, so thank you for talking about that with us, help clearing it up. I really do appreciate that because uh, it's very confusing to a guy like me, which means it's confusing to most people um, because. Um, no, I appreciate it. I always know you ask the tough questions. Last time I came on your show, you grilled me on the dual endorsement of AOC. But I, I'm still proud that I'm the uh, only member of Congress or senator who. Uh, who endorsed her? Yeah, the 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 the, uh, the dual endorsement. I remember that. Yes. So listen, um, the problem with Bernie. I know you have to go, but uh, uh, if Bernie wins, I I say that you know it, his, he needs better strategy, right? Because the strategy in 2016, he had the people around him were a little bit out of touch, which is a nice way to say that they missed the boat on alternative media in 2016. You know, they didn't go on the Young Turks until March of 2016. And the co the contest was already over by that time. So uh, they've done a lot. For instance, they blew out his voice the night before the debate and then they rested it after the debate. They, these kind of <laughs> rookie mistakes, you know, like right now, like, again, repeating CA talking points or endorsing Joe Biden a year and a half out. Uh, you know, you don't need that. That gets you nothing. But my point. So my question is, he ne he has to now differentiate himself from Elizabeth Warren, right? And he's not really doing it because uh, because he's a much better candidate. Uh, we know that. So how does he do it? Well, I'd say there are two things. Uh, I'll ask you your question directly. But first, uh, he has to distinguish himself from Joe Biden because the uh, place where uh, he is losing votes to Joe Biden, ironically, are working class voters under 50 uh, in Iowa, uh, many of them white working class voters under 50, and Biden, because of this narrative of being the uh, the person who grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, with this image, uh, is getting some of those votes, and Sanders is their second choice. So I think he has to clearly point out that he has been fighting for unions. He's for Medicare for all. Joe Biden isn't. He has opposed NAFTA. Joe Biden was for NAFTA and TPP. Uh, he has uh, fought for a $15 minimum wage. Joe Biden hasn't. And that he's really the champion of the working class in, in a way that Joe Biden isn't. I mean, Joe Biden has a nice story, but he's not really been fighting for them. And that is the biggest way that he's going to uh, build a coalition. Because a lot of Senator Warren's support, just polling-wise, is college-educated uh, liberal voters. And Bernie's base, you even look at people giving him money, they're the working class. I mean, he gets most of his money from Walmart, Amazon workers. And uh, at some reason, he's splitting that with Joe Biden. But so that's the first order of business. And the second thing, and I think he can win if he gets just convinces those voters uh, that they should come to him instead of Biden. But the second thing is that there are differences between him and, and Senator Warren. I would argue the biggest differences are on uh, foreign policy that, uh, you know, Senator 
Uh, Sanders has been more vocal in standing up to defense defense budgets. He's been uh, more outspoken on uh, uh, issues of human rights uh, around the world. And so uh, I, I do think he can draw uh, that contrast. And he can also draw the contrast on uh, he's a movement politician. I mean, he is someone who really believes that it's a movement that's going to change uh, uh, politics. Yeah, I believe also I think electoral politics will be a smaller part. Uh, you know, I've said if we're going to get Medicare for all, we're going to have to eventually get in the street, put on a yellow vest and shut things down because it's the Democratic Party who is also standing in front of us getting our progressive agenda implemented. For instance, you know, I make the case all the time, Ro, that in California we have a supermajority Democrats. We have a Democratic uh, governor. We have the fifth largest economy in the world. We don't even have a public option. They all, Every politician, including Anthony Rendon, runs on Medicare for all. And then when he gets in a po- position of power to implement, Implement that policy, he acts like he never thought about it. I don't know how to do it. There's no way <laughs> well, to do you it. Know, there's, you're absolutely right. I mean, Gavin Newsom ran, ran on a single pair and Medicare for, uh, for all. That's what he ran on. That's how he beat uh, Vera Gosa. That's how he got the nurses union behind him. And uh, now, you know, he called his office, called me up. He said, well, can you get federal legislation for a waiver for states to be able to do this? I said, I'm happy to do that. Pramila Jayapal already worked on that. But don't wait for that legislation to be signed by a Democratic president. Go pass the bill out of the Assembly, out of the Senate, and and sign it, and let it be ready to go. So the day we get a Democratic president, uh, California is ready to go. And that's what the California nurses want. But it is is not not justifiable for us not to at least uh, pass Medicare for all out of uh, California. And I, I, I share your frustrations, as do, by the way, the California nurses. So that's the thing, like, you know, the, the, the problem Bernie supporters have with the way Bernie's handled things like that is that he, they, he, doesn't, he doesn't fight against the Democratic Party hard enough. I know that he, he, he's fought harder than anyone else. Uh, fought harder than I have. I mean, I call myself a Democrat and I, uh, you know, and I, I take on fights uh, here and there. But, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders has fought uh, harder than anyone uh, in the party uh, against uh, some of those interests. So the uh, you know, the reason Trump ran is because he didn't play by the rules and he ran against the uh, yeah. Republican Party. I think Bernie, uh, my opinion is he plays too much by the rules. After they cheated him, he then endorsed the person who cheated him. Then he went on a unity tour with the party that cheated him and put sound cannons on his own supporters, delegates. at the th- So Trump would have never done that, uh, something like that. But Bernie does. And I think that's the kind of thing uh, that holds him back. So is there a way he can run more against the party, even in the primary? I don't think that's... Uh what he needs to do. I think he needs to, to, to win. He needs to run against Trump. And, and he got, he's got to show that, mm. well, Trump spoke to the frustrations of people who were forgotten. He called them forgotten Americans. And then he forgot them. I mean, he mm-hmm. what has he done for the 70 million Americans uh, households who make less than $75,000 a year? How is their life any better off? Well, Bernie spoke to those voters. He spoke to those voters in a way that I don't think any other candidate can. And I've seen him on the trail because he speaks simply he says, look, I'm going to get your wages up. I'm going to give you health care. I'm going to give you uh, a real education uh, and I'm going to get you housing. Uh, and this system has not worked for you. And I think that he's got to make the case uh, to win the primary of electability, that he can carry those counties that Trump carried uh, better than any other Democrat. And OK, uh, I, I would just urge that he needs to somehow find a way to you know, uh, be the anti-establishment. He has to run against that Democratic Party much harder. And I think just the way Trump did, you know, when Trump took down Jeb Bush, it, you know, the whole country cheered for him when he did that. Right. So uh, that's the well, kind that's of- dynasty. Yeah. You know, I, I think the era of dynasty politics, dynasty politicians is is over. Uh, and we saw that in the 2016 uh, uh, election. But I think that, uh, that 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 the Bernie Sanders does have to run as an independent. He's got to run is someone who uh, appeals to rural voters, who can appeal to independents, who's taking on the system, uh, who will uh, call out his party when justified. Uh, but I think he needs also to, to, to be a coalition builder. I mean, Trump has been incredibly divisive for this country. And uh, you don't want just a uh, reflection of him uh, on the progressive side. And that's not who Bernie Sanders is. Bernie Sanders wants to bring this country together uh, and help lead the country in a in a way that uh, uh, it, it, that is reflective of common values. 
Uh, so let me just ask you one more question before we uh, let you go. Uh, don't don't you uh, find it? Why do you think the other candidates are attacking Medicare for all? And shouldn't that itself disqualify them from the Democratic nomination? It certainly should in the disingenuous way they're doing it, right? I mean, if they just had a honest disagreement, uh, I would say, okay, you can debate, but uh, uh, I disagree with you. But to say uh, things like, oh, they're going to take away your choice. They're going to take away your insurance. All Medicare for all is, is extending what people have over 65 to everyone in the country. So if you believe in Medicare for people who are over 65, why wouldn't you believe in it for everyone? Everyone is forced, quote unquote, onto Medicare after 65. You automatically are enrolled. You can't get duplicative insurance for Medicare. That's the current law. All Bernie's bill does is extend that to everyone. So what I would say to people who are opposed to Bernie Sanders' Medicare for all bill is you're a hypocrite if you are for Medicare for people over 65 and are opposed to Bernie Sanders. Either you got to take the Republican view of privatization of Medicare, uh, or you should be for giving everyone the same thing that seniors have. Okay, I agree with that. And before we let you go, you know, here our big deal at this show is to debunk Russiagate. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, do you really think Trump colluded with Russia and we just weren't able to catch him? I think Russians interfered with our elections through social media propaganda. Uh, and I don't think, I mean, what do you think of the call on uh, with Ukraine? I mean, to uh, get dirt on Joe Biden. I mean, that, that's sort of indefensible. Uh, but I do think that where I where I agree with a lot of progressives is uh, we can't just have the anti-Trump case. We also have to make the positive case. And the Democratic Party ought to stand up there and say, uh, we did mess up for 40 years. There was a deindustrialization in this country. Small towns were dwindling. Uh, uh, we didn't do enough to uh, pay attention to people who were losing jobs and opportunity. And we've got to do better in uh, caring about communities that were totally left behind, workers that were left behind, communities of color that have been left behind, uh, and, and and own up to some of the failures of neoliberal policy over the last 40 years. I would love to see that that's what we need to have. We need to have a reckoning with the 40 years of neoliberalism that threw workers overboard a long time ago. But, Ro, thanks for taking time. I appreciate you answering our questions and clearing things up for us. And uh, good luck on the campaign trail. Thanks, Jimmy. I always love that we get honest talk and tough questions, but you're always fair. So I always love being on. OK, take care. Take care, buddy. Bye bye. Everybody, we're doing a live show every Sunday in October in Hollywood, California at the Sycamore Tavern. Go to JimmyDoreComedy.com for a link for tickets and become a patron. We give you hours of bonus material every month. Become a premium member. Go to JimmyDoreComedy.com and sign up. Thanks for your support.